Hello and welcome to this very special broadcast. My name is Mohammed Saleh. Now, the Russia-Africa summit that is presently underway in St. Petersburg has thrown up some very interesting factors that will be looked at in the weeks to come. Remember, ever since Russia decided to pull the plug on the Black Sea grain deal, the fear that there could be widespread shortage of food grains around the world is, is something that has dominated headlines. So how does Russia deal with something like this? What it has done is in its Africa-Russia summit that is presently underway in St. Petersburg, it has promised to provide six African nations with free grain to a certain extent. But will this in any way help the global food crisis, which is, is something that the world will have to look at in the next few weeks, is, is an issue that will be debated. Because remember, last year, in the year 2022, an estimated 33 million tonnes of food grains had been exported from Ukraine. And these grains, this year, in the year 2023, may not make it out of the ports from Ukraine. So how does the world deal with this? And is Russia now firefighting essentially a crisis that it has set off? To tell us more, we're being joined by Mr. Ben Aris, who's the founder and editor-in-chief of the BNE Intelli News and also the former Moscow bureau chief for the Daily Telegraph. Now, ben Aris has been covering Russia since 1993 and he's joining us live on this broadcast and beyond. Now, Mr. Aris, this, this is going to be a significant moment in the way Russia wants to position itself diplomatically it is conducting its Russia-Africa summit. It is presently underway in St. Petersburg. And let me begin by asking you about this big announcement that's been made by Vladimir Putin, where he said that six African nations will get free grain from Russia. Does it in any way offset the food grain crisis that has been sparked by the fact that the plug has been pulled on the Black Sea grain deal? Indeed. Well, the, the, to under, it's kind of a complicated story. To understand this, there's two parts. Uh, there's the, the actual economics of the grain deliveries, you know, the physical grain that needs to go to countries that uh, rely on it. And uh, the, other, the other side of the story is the politics of it. So first thing to say is that the Ukrainian grain uh, exports, the three quarters of them actually uh, go to the EU and to China. China is the single biggest importer of Ukrainian grain. And that um, the volumes that go to Africa are relatively small, uh, right. up to 33, and I think it's just a, a few million that go to Africa. However, the countries that receive that grain, Egypt being one, uh, Yemen being another, um, they're very heavily dependent on Ukrainian imports. And so for those specific countries, um, they might have a problem. And what Putin announced, these six countries, um, include some of those extremely dependent countries uh, right. on Ukrainian grain that Russia is going to replace it. So in terms of actual food shortages, um, physical delivery of grain, um, I think Putin, what he's done is he's making sure that his friends in Africa mm -hmm. are supplied because he's relying on African nations to join his BRIC plus club, his non-aligned alliance against the West who are ignoring sanctions. And he needs to keep them on board. But at the same time, he wants to squeeze the Ukrainian economy because the Ukrainian economy, the only hard currency it's earning at the moment is from grain exports. It's worth $20 billion a year. And the economy in Ukraine, the government in Ukraine has no money. Right. So it's, it's a playoff here in between the two. Absolutely. Um, and, and go ahead. Now, the question that I also want to ask you, Mr. Aris, is uh, the Western nations are now considering a possibility that, listen, we don't need to take the grain out from Ukraine, only from the Black Sea ports of Ukraine. Rather, this grain can be transported via the land border. They can be brought to other places and from there it could be exported to the rest of the world where it needs to go. Do you think that's a proposal that can actually work? Not really. That's very problematic. Uh, in so much as that because of the restrictions that have already been on Black Sea grain exports, Ukraine has already made very heavy use of its railway in order to use the land route out through Central Europe to reach international markets. And as I say, um, the biggest, you know, fifth, at least a fifth of the grain goes to the EU. Mm -hmm. And what happened was uh, all this cheap Ukrainian grain arriving on the Polish market, uh, Hungarian market, collapsed the local prices, the local market. And so those countries have actually banned imports of Ukrainian grain. And moreover, the EU or the European Commission has actually extended that ban for five months. And so you can't send a lot more grain that route because it doesn't end up in Africa. It ends up on the European markets and they swamp the markets. And the local markets, the local um, agricultural producers in somewhere like Poland right. uh, are being put out of it. So the other route, there is a possibility of sending it via the Danube. 
uh, a waterway that would go into the international market. Um, however, the Russians have started bombing the port that deals with the Danube Road. So that's looking difficult. And it comes down to, to rail tracks. There's simply not the capacity on Ukrainian railways going west uh, in order to export this volume of grain. You, you need ships. You know, the way you've put uh, out so the something. logistics of, you know, how Ukraine can export its grain, and, and you're saying that it is difficult for Ukraine to, in fact, rely on its rail network to also get grain out of its borders. So the question that I want to ask you, Mr. Aris, is this. You know, who is likely to get the most impacted because of the shortage of food grains that is going to come about because of the fact that the Black Sea Grain Corridor is now virtually almost certainly shut. So who does it impact the most? Because the West says that it is nations in Africa and Asia who are going to be the worst hit. But you seem to be suggesting that it is Europe that is going to be the worst hit. Well, Europe is not going to suffer a shortage. Uh, and the issue here is not so much, as I said at the beginning, the volume, the physical volume of grain. It's the impact on the prices. That's Absolutely. what does the damage. Because if there's a shortage, if the market is spooked, and it is spooked in so much as prices are already up by 6%, what that does is, although there's physical grain available, that it becomes too expensive. And so the cost of living, you know, the, the sustenance it is in poor countries, people simply cannot afford to buy food. The food is there. And also you have to bear in mind that last year, Russia had an all-time bumper harvest of 150 million tons of grain. Mm -hmm. Its silos are full to bursting. It's also exporting record tons, uh, 60 million tons of grain, and it's expected to do at least the same. Right. And so, in a, a lot, of, uh, Russia can actually make up a lot of the Ukrainian shortfall on its own. In fact, it needs to. It needs to boost its own exports, uh, and of course, it earns money from doing that. But like I say, the the problem is because of these problems, because of the logistics of it, where the grain actually physically goes or how it gets there, mm -hmm. prices have gone up. That's what does the real damage. That's what's putting African countries at risk, even those who are not close by, even those who are not on sort of the northern African board, um, seashore, uh, further down into Africa, sub-Sahara right. Africa. They're in danger because they can't afford the grain, although Absolutely. physically there is grain to send them. Now, Mr. Aris, uh, there's also the politics of what's, what's playing out at this moment. Uh, the last time round in 2019, when the Russia-Africa summit had been held, a total of 43 African nations had attended the summit. But this time round, it's being said that probably about 16 or 17 of them are present in St. Petersburg. Now, the Western nations are saying that this is quite clearly an indicator which shows that the African nations are not on board, or definitely they do not want to be seen in St. Petersburg, in the Russia-Africa summit, which shows that Russia has not been able to achieve some of its political objectives of this summit. Do you agree with our assessment? No, it's a little more subtle than that. Um, actually, there's about 49 African nations present at the summit. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about, the 17 are heads of state. And in the previous one, in 2019, uh, all the heads of state, all the countries were represented by heads of state. Uh, what's happened this time is only 17 or so, maybe 20 uh, heads of state have turned up. But the other countries are represented by foreign minister or top ministers. And for Putin, it's very important for the prestige to be dealing with the heads of state, um, that it should be a president to president thing. And that's the result of pressure, extreme pressure by the US asking heads of state not to go. And African countries find themselves in a very delicate position because on the one hand they're very interested in Russia's help because of the finance, the investment it makes, particularly nuclear technology, but on, in addition to that the commodities, oil, gas and, and grain, and arms. Uh, a lot of uh, African countries are heavily dependent on Russian arms. And so trying to navigate between the pressure from the US on one side and the pressure from the Kremlin on the other side, what they've done, some of them have compromised and said right. instead of sending the president, they sent the foreign minister. And so that's a blow for Putin's prestige. But I think bottom line is we've still got, you know, 46, 49 countries, All right. 54 mm -hmm. presence. Uh, and so they're continuing their relations. And Russia will reward the countries there where the heads of state went. Mm -hmm. So they'll get extra deals, they'll get free grain, they'll get, you know, concessions on arms, they'll get long term financing for their nuclear power stations. Right. So it's again, this is a subtle Cold War era style diplomacy going on.
So my final question to you, Mr. Aris, is this. You know, last month we saw these extraordinary scenes where a delegation from Africa visited both Russia and Ukraine and they presented a peace proposal. And what has now come out of St. Petersburg is that Vladimir Putin has assured the African leaders that he's very carefully considering the various things that, that the African leaders have proposed to bring about peace in this war. Um, you know, what, what do you think is likely to be the, the amount of leverage that the African nations will have? both on Russia as well as on Ukraine, in pushing or nudging both these nations towards some kind of a peace proposal? Well, Africa's in a kind of interesting position in the moment, uh, in so much as it's been largely ignored for the last 30 years. Um, although traditionally Russia um, has very good ties with Africa as a legacy of the Soviet Union. Um, but they've been largely ignored. And for the first time, we, we seem like uh, Ramposa from South Africa actually on the international geopolitical stage proposing you know, peace plans in Europe. Uh, we've never seen that before. Um, and like I said, the Africans find themselves in a difficult position between being pressured by the US and being pressured by the Russia. And at the same time, African nations need help from everybody. They need everything. They need investment. They need infrastructure. They need technology, uh, aid. Um, there's a debt crisis causing many of the African countries big problems. And I think at the end of the day, the Africans would like to see this crisis end. It's right. causing a headache that they can do without. And so they've done their piece. I mean, they've come up with a peace proposal. And Putin needs to listen to them because he needs to keep Africa on board in his non-aligned coalition to ignore sanctions, to limit America's power, power. But at the same time, they have very little leverage. I don't think they can actually move the needle here. Um, but they've made their interests uh, hurt, mm -hmm. and Putin has to take that into consideration. Um, but you know, they're actually benefiting from this because they're getting a lot of development aid and investment from Russia. And at the same time, the states last December set up an Africa infrastructure fund of $600 billion and also intend to throw money at Africa to bring them around to their side. Right. So Africa are actually benefiting this from the both sides. In the meantime, they just have to learn, which they haven't done before, this complicated, subtle diplomatic game of balancing the interests of these superpowers. And this Ukrainian peace proposal is their first foray into that Absolutely. particular game. Absolutely indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Ben Aris, for joining us and getting us all your insights there. Pleasure. Beyond is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.